My name is John Fields, and I'm the Lydia Cheney and Jim Sokol Endowed Director for AVA. Um, and if you are joining us for the first time tonight, AVA is a visual arts center located on the campus of the University of Alabama at Birmingham. We present eight to 10 exhibitions a year, highlighting a mix of regionally, nationally, and internationally acclaimed artists focused almost exclusively on contemporary art. We serve a diverse audience of university faculty, staff, and students, as well as artists, museum patrons, and donors, while simultaneously striving to keep our exhibitions directly relevant and engaging to our surrounding Birmingham communities. We help represent the visual arts at UAB to local and regional institutions, but also the national and international art community. Since opening in 2014, Ava has been featured in the New York Times, the Huffington Post, the Nation, Raw Vision Magazine, PBS Canvas, among others. And we are proud that all of our exhibitions and the vast majority of our related educational programming, such as tonight, are free and open to the public. Um, since the quarantine, we've been hosting a series of weekly uh, live Zoom events featuring discussions and interviews with artists, curators, galleries, and collectors from all over the country with guests from many corners of the globe at this point. And I just wanted to take a second to thank you all for attending tonight. Um, and then I'm going to hand it over to Ava Assistant Curator, Tina Ruggieri. I will say that this, uh, our guest tonight is one that Tina and I are incredibly passionate about. Um, and I'm going to let her have the honors to introduce her this evening. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Tina. Thank you. Um, well, hello, everyone. And I just want to thank you all um, as well for being here tonight um, for Ava's uh, Inside the Arts program. And we're featuring Shona McAndrews tonight. Um, as John said, my name is Tina Ruggieri, and I'm the assistant curator at AVA. And first, I just want to take a moment to thank um, Gabrielle Suzinski at Moore College of Art and Design and Clara Ha at Chart in New York. Both were instrumental in helping to make this exhibition possible. I would also like to thank the Alabama State Council on the Arts for their generous support of this exhibition and my boss, John Fields, for believing in this exhibition as much as I did and traveling with me to pick up the work in a 16-foot box truck over a three-day period during a pandemic. Um, and then finally, I would like to thank Shona for creating this amazing body of work and the fact that we get to share this with our patrons here in Birmingham. Shona is known for paintings and sculptures that depict women in their personal spaces. Drawing from a variety of historical and personal references, she renders fl fleeting yet intimate moments of vulnerability in the daily lives of women seldom portrayed in art history. Shona holds an MFA in painting from the Rhode Island of School of Design and a BA in psychology and painting from Brandeis University. She's had solo exhibitions at the Moore College of Art and Design in Philadelphia, Chart in New York, and Spring Break Art Show in New York. She has also exhibited in group shows at Stems Gallery in Brussels, Mindy Solomon Gallery in Miami, and the Museum of Sex in New York. Tonight, Shona is going to give us a little insight into her process and her current exhibition Wednesday night. As a reminder, we love questions, um, so please feel free to use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen, or you can save your question till the very end when Shona is done, and you can just ask her directly. And now I'm going to hand it over to Shona. Hi. Um, I, though I'm trying to tell my brain that this is not actual public spe uh, speaking because I'm just sitting in my kitchen right now. I'm still just as anxious as if I were, so if I stutter or say um one too many times, it's because I have been, I'm unable to not feel the nerves. So I'm going to share my screen right now. Okay, so I'm going to start all the way back in 2014. I think a lot of my process is reflecting on the last body of work I did. I, I think my work in, is quite linear, and so it's important to start to show you where I started. Um, my first finished or, uh, you know, completed fin uh, pieces were these watercolors. And I did them in 2014, and I had the privilege of having wonderful professors, and one just said, put something that you care about in front of you and paint it. And I love this wear raincoat that I bought with my mother this one rainy day when we are in Scotland visiting her mother. And it meant so much to me, and I wanted to do this coat justice. 
and I have learned so much about looking. And though it's a very small part of where my work is now, it's an important piece. And it was the learning to look and learning to care and to slow down. And I always joke to myself, no one's around me when I make these jokes, but most of my practice it comes from perseverance. I never really stop until I get to where I want to be. And these watercolors, I think, really taught me that that technique works. Um, that's the same watercolor as the one before, and I was starting to learn what it meant to organize a scene. I mean, I felt I am someone who likes to second guess all my own thoughts, and I need, you know, I needed to learn how to not worry so much about what I was making or how to position things. And I think these, again, this watercolors really helped me do that and understand what it means to have things next to each other. The coat is so different when it's hanging on a wall than it is on top of these shoes. And even though it took me a long time to understand that difference, I was starting to note that there is a big importance to, you know, the image that you're making. Just like right here, this dress, that's my dress, and next to this chair, and I think this is when distortions also come in. I'm a plus size lady, and I've never not been a bigger person. Um, even as a kid, my father's favorite joke is, I was born in Paris, France, and I'm from American father and a Scottish mother. And his joke is that he knew I was his baby because I was twice as fat as all the French babies. So I like to say that I had less than five seconds of not being the biggest person in every room I've ever been in. And I think that sneaks in a lot, you know, looking, I remember professors telling me, why is the dress so big? I'm like, because it's my dress. You know, I'm starting to understand that you have control of the images over what you're painting. And this is still that same body of work. This is the first time I painted a person. This is Cassandra, um, Lenny. This is Lenny and Drag. Um, and it was a very exciting moment of back and forth between me and a model. You know, she, this is how she wanted to be seen. She has only recently come out as transgender. So I think this was a first step in her own view of herself. And she allowed me to be part of it in some ways by painting how she wanted to be seen. And I think that's something that has remained and is very important to my current body of work. But I learned a lot from this specific moment where she really did sit in front of me and she got to pick these amazing shoes and the incredible coat and all these decisions were hers and I got to participate in these decisions. And I think that back and forth of the model is so important to my work now and I have Cassandra to thank for that. And this is one of my first pieces from RISD. Still watercolor at that point, I'd really only done watercolors. And she's my, one of my first plus size bodies that I painted. At that point, I was certainly not comfortable admitting I was plus size. Not that one has to admit it, it's just there. But I thought if I didn't say it, no one would know. So I never wanted to say that I was a bigger person. And I certainly couldn't acknowledge that the reason why I was painting her is because she was a bigger person. And I remember fearing standing in front of my work because I didn't want anyone to know that maybe it had something to do with me, which is quite crazy because since then I've done multiple self-portraits and sculptures of myself naked. So I'm certainly no longer afraid of that. But this was this big moment of I, I loved her so much and I think her skin is so beautiful and, and I had so much fun looking at it and I just could not admit that it had anything to do with me other than the just happened to found her picture and I just happened to be painting her. And I, that question of um, what, why am I painting these women and is it about me just came, I couldn't ignore it. And from People asking me if it, ha if it was me, which felt very hurtful at that time, because again, I was hiding, I was a plus size woman. No one knew at that point that I was plus size. Um, and so I just had to confront this reality by photographing myself. These are some, uh, I think the first ever selfies I had taken. I was not particularly obsessed with looking at myself or interest in doing so. And so these pictures were quite challenging. I filmed myself later in my studio with a camera and then I would go through the film and screenshot my favorite moments. And I turned them into digital collages. And at that point I was thinking so much, um, the big question in my mind is why am I painting women? 
And why does one paint women, especially with such an incredible history of women being painted and being a key part of you know art history and men being the one painting them and why am I as a woman painting more women and do, do we need more images of women? And I think I was able to answer that question by painting myself because as at that point I was slowly admitting that I was perhaps a bigger woman and it meant a lot for me to see myself represented. I have body dysmorphia, which I think a lot of a lot of women have, and it helped me disassociate from myself as a person. So even though I see that this is me, all I really saw was a plus size lady, and I felt you no know, consoled by seeing that. And I was introducing at that point a very direct relationship to art history. This right here is me acting out Matisse's Odalisques which uh, are paintings that I grew up with. As I said, I grew up in Paris and I had the benefit of going to the Louvre and all these incredible museums weekly. Um, and I thought that's what paintings were supposed to be like. And I thought this is how women are supposed to be painted. You know, they know that they're being looked at and they're sitting there and they're waiting. And I started playing around with the idea of but what would I would be doing if I were sitting there. I rarely just sit doing nothing, being looked at. I tend to be wasting my time in many effective ways. Um, and so here, you know, I, there's multiple versions of this collage. I have a computer on my lap and I don't. And my leg is up and my leg is down. All these things that just were me acting out this pose. And it led to one of my first life-size sculptures. Unfortunately, her back is turned right now. She's on the left of me, but we'll see her as a full body later on. And these are my first life-size sculptures. These three, they are in the show. Oh, two of them are at the show at Ava. Um, and I've worked on them many times since, but this is the first iteration of them. And I was very excited by making sculptures. I felt very limited by my paintings at that time. As I said, I didn't stop questioning why painting, why more paintings of women, and why am I doing it? And I realized something I was so interested in was making people confront these bodies. And I think that has probably a lot to do with how I was confronting my own body. And I just felt like a painting was not enough, but a sculpture did something more. It's a real object in space. And... I feared, you know, if people didn't want to look at a plus size body or look at a body waxing her legs, the woman sitting down with her back to her is waxing her legs. We'll see her also later. Um, they may not want to look at, but they certainly can ignore it or ignore them because they're in the same room as them in the same space. And that was quite a thrill for me. I mean, as I stand there, I look really just like my sculptures and the number of time I hang out with my sculptures and I move and I scare someone because I thought I was a sculptor or, you know, that always happens. And I, I really enjoyed blending and becoming one of them and have them become real people. Here is my dear uh, Charlotte. This is like, I've redone her three times since from this version to this version. And over what's been four years since I've made her, five years, and she's developed into such a character and such a, a woman. And there's nothing I love more than people's reactions to her, which are typically, oh my God, were you looking at me in the bathroom last night? That's exactly what I was doing. More than any other sculptor, Charlotte is the one that everyone responds to that way. I assume every woman at this point stands in her bathroom doing this because how else would I have been told that so many times? And she's just so damn proud and tall and she's so big. And it's everything I wanted my work to be, which was um, a both unforgettable, but you can't deny her existence, which is perhaps something I felt as a, as a woman, and as a plus size woman, I was used to say that I always felt like the, the invisible elephant in the room. I was both so big and impossible to ignore, but I felt invisible and I didn't want to be seen. And I think Charlotte kind of undid a lot of those feelings by, you know, you cannot ignore her from no angle. She is everywhere. Then this is my next step after these large sculptures. I had just left graduate, graduate school and I no longer had an unbelievably big studio and all the time on my hand, I had to get a job. 
I worked at a museum and I, but I was still very interested in what it meant to make these women physical beings and physical, um, I don't want to say objects because they don't feel like objects to me, but they are an art object. And so I started making my first small sculptures. And what I love so much about these is I have since sold that little lady, but I do remember that she fit in my arms very much like a newborn baby. And she felt very precious and very, I don't know, small, her little, little fingies and her little toes. And I just love little things like that. And I love that she's so dainty, but yet she's so, a lady lying her back, checking out what her vagina looks like. And from if she, if I had the sculpture in front of you, I can show you it's an actual mirror in her hand. And I try to measure. She actually can see herself from that angle. So it's it's a potentially real moment of a woman looking at herself, which is something I think a lot of women don't do. I think a lot of women spend a lot of time and money on prepping their vagina, and that they don't actually know what it looks like. So I. Again, that idea of looking at yourself and acknowledging that you have a body and acknowledging what the body does. Um, all of these things are, are very, were very important to these sculptures right then. Same thing with Josephine, this contortion, and she's bent over looking at herself and she's stepping on her little toes. And I just love that this little precious doll is a fat lady looking at her vagina when, you know, that's just I mean, I've, to me, that's very funny, but it's also very exciting because I'd never seen it. Um, and there was all these things that my paintings weren't able to do, but I, I really did want my work, you know, to help others feel as well. So this is my last little sculpture from that time, and she's Elizabeth, and I love her very much. She's it's my mother's middle name, um, and it's based on an actual memory of hers being pregnant with me and living in a little apartment and being in a little bath and getting to know a different changing body. And that just made me, you know, I felt I relate to that as I don't, you know, you don't need to be pregnant or be going through such a big change to just be learning to love your body. And so I created this woman who's far too big for her bath, but she seems so at peace and so comfortable with herself. And I have to tell you, I have not yet done it, but I really want to make a life-size version of this sculpture. I think that would be very thrilling. I've yet to figure out how to make a paper mache bath of that size, but I will get there. Um, after these little sculptures, uh, my boyfriend and I, Stuart Landry, who's back, you see right there, we moved to California for nine months and we were up in the mountains in a studio in the middle of trees. You would only see a human if you drove to a supermarket. It was, no one was there. It was amazing. And so I was alone with my boyfriend all the time. And my body in relation to his was very evident. He's a very thin, athletic boy. He grew up in California and was the captain of, like, every sport you've ever heard of. He was the captain of it for, like, seven minutes. Um, and I would say that's nothing to do with who I am as a person. I have been the captain of zero teams. And, you know, I feel like I learned a long time ago that bigger bodies don't deserve a counterpart, a person to be with them, and certainly not a fit young man. And so I think I, I just really needed for myself and for a young version of me that exists out there, and there are so many young women like me, who just needs to see what it looks like to have our bodies together. And I think that's why I did this sculpture. Very uninteresting fact that I got my first cavity when I did this sculpture of me brushing my teeth. And I just feel like there has to be something there. It was a wisdom too, so they took it out and I don't have cavity anymore, but that feels like quite a coincidence. Um, anyway, so this led to this sculpture of me and my boyfriend lying in bed. And, I remember at the beginning of making the sculpture, I was so embarrassed and my God, my belly really does this crazy slope when I lie in that angle and I'm so wide and damn, you're so tiny, Stuart. Your hips are the third of my size and all these anxieties. And by the end, you know, two months straight of making them, it felt so normal. Like I, I, I almost forgot what it looked like not to have a big body next to a tiny body because that was suddenly a reality and they're really there in front of me. 
And so just in making them, I can, you know, I dealt with a lot of these ideas. And I love this piece so very much because I think a lot of people see it as a very sexual moment. My hand is touching his flaccid penis, but to me it's, I would say it's more sensual. I, I like to think I could be touching his belly or his leg. It's any part of his body. It's just how our bodies are touching in that moment. And it it's a real moment. You know, I think everyone who's been intimate with someone has experienced something like this. And I somehow, despite all, all these feelings of it being a very important piece, I was unbelievably underwhelmed by it. I painted the walls that I showed it in, but it just felt so incomplete. And that links back to those first watercolors I showed you where I know how to focus on something I really care about, but what happens around it? And I could not answer that. And so this was when I started making digital collages. And these digital collages were at first nothing serious. Oh, I'm so sorry. Someone just had the audacity of walking by my house. So my dog must bark. Um, so this was a lot of fun for me to start imagining who these women are and what spaces they would be in and what hair products they're using and what color bathrooms I think they like. And I was able to start fleshing out these ideas and these women and making them into real people and creating real moments, at least visually for me. And yeah, this is this is the, we saw the collage earlier on of me with a computer on my lap. This is the sculpture. And I, uh, I don't know, this is what I assume I would do on a lazy Sunday morning, you know, twirling my pubic hair because it's warm and fuzzy. And I'd be thinking about everything I did that week. And I would, you know, all these things start happening and I start understanding who she is. And these were decisions I had a very hard time making earlier on because of pressures I had. I don't know what it was, but these digital collages felt, you know, there was no stress behind them. I could just make it and have fun and I can create multiples. This sculpture has multiple digital collages because I imagined multiple scenes where I would be sitting like that. Um, and it allowed me to start using myself as you know, straight me in these digital collages. Uh, same ideas with the sculptures, you know, me on the toilet brushing my teeth, you know, saving time as we all have to do late at night and just enjoying picturing a bathroom I wish I had that is full of color and the cat sleeping. And I only have one cat, but I always wish I had two. And here is my moment uh, to shine. And then also having fun finding this painting behind me and trying to, starting to find, to con starting to work on that relationship between me, the model, and art history and what it means to paint a woman now and how women have been represented in the past. And these digital collages really helped me make that very literal. You know, this is a Maclean Thomas painting behind, I mean, photograph behind me or digital collage, collage and make in my digital collage and I'm referencing her reference and but it's in my fiction like um, this fiction and this world I'm inventing and all of these are these rules are things that I started to implement in my installation which comes up later and my paintings um, this is one of my favorite little digital collages mainly for the title which is the moment she realized she had toe hair and which is something that happens to me, I think once a week I realize I have toe hair and I get completely overwhelmed by how horrible it is and then I forget and then a week later I'm reminded again. And I think that's so much more real as a moment, as a, as a woman than it is the painting behind her of sitting on a rock by a lake, which is naked, which is not something I have done a lot of, but I certainly have sat in my underwear freaking out over how dark my toe hair is. And I think it's actually darker than last week and, you know, this, you know, having fun, being comfortable in a body that isn't what I thought a woman's body was supposed to be. And as a young woman, I assumed we were all going to be pristine. And as an adult, you know how to have a, you're all put together and you have control over everything. And I think that turns out that's nothing to do with being a human and nothing really is under control. And you're always learning new things. And these watercolors and pieces, this is where helping me you know, flesh out those ideas about what it meant for me to be a woman. Then uh, this is when I, this is my spring break 
installation in 2018, uh, 19, but I worked on it over 2018 to 2019. And I took that sculpture and it, the, that I showed you a couple of slides before and used all the rules and all the things I had just learned in my digital collage, which is fleshing out and inventing everything else around a person and not feeling any pressure or stress about it and just being very honest and understanding that it's not just the bodies, but it's everything happening around it that you know led to that moment from the snack I didn't finish or the snack I'm about to eat to the condoms and to the lube and to referencing moments that makes our couple in that moment real. Here are some other angles of this. And you can see there's multiple empty cans and makeup everywhere and tampons everywhere. I don't know if other women feel this way, but I have a thousand tampons just hiding across my house at all times. And it was very fun to make that into a sculpture. There's my very pink butt. Um, and another close-up of my things, my bits and pieces, and again, introducing an art history and quite literal hints at it to make that connection back and forth between how women were represented throughout time and what it means for me to represent a woman. There go. I, the, right after my installation at Spring Break, I had the opportunity to have my first solo show of paintings in New York at Chart. And I was able to start learning from, um, sorry, I'm skipping through it faster than I mean to be, from the installation and learning the use of light and I don't know, everything that I had learned before that led me to this process, which is still something I'm using now. It's only been two years. So I'm still figuring out how to make paintings and how I want to make them. But I start off with an art historical painting, painted by a man of a woman waiting, typically, um, to be, as I like to say, activated by a man, which is what I feel like a lot of art history is. And then act it out myself and put myself in this imaginary space. Again, imagining what a woman would really be doing if she were in that pose. And here, if the image were bigger, you'd see I'm lying on a pile of laundry because that is a reality in my room at least. And then I found a model and sent it out to her and that's the third image there. And as a side note, I absolutely asked my model before using this picture and always ask your models if you're gonna show pictures. And then the final one is the painting that brings together the, you know, the three images before. And I like to joke that I make a, it's like a art historical game of telephone. And the final painting is a response to, her image, which is a response to my digital collage, which is, a, which is a response to our historical painting. And, you know, all are important and come together. I'm sorry, my cat just ran in the room and then that got my dog really excited. Um, so yeah, more of these paintings right now. So the dog just got carried out. We're good, we're safe. Um, so more of these paintings, I started reaching out to women in my life who I thought were impressively themselves and had, you know, even though I know we all may put on a, you know, we might act a bit more confident than we really are. These women just felt very confident to me and very aware of who they are. And my dear friend, Alexandria in a bathroom. And I just, I particularly like this painting. It's so soft and sweet. And it's exactly what it feels like when you have a cat because they never leave you alone and she's on the bathroom and on the toilet and she probably needs a minute to herself. And this is a real moment. I asked her to photograph herself and her cat interrupted the picture and reached up for her. So it, it, I just love that this, there certainly was no cat with a woman on a toilet in the original picture in the painting, but I'm so happy that my interpretation of it has that because that's how I've experienced having a body and a toilet and a cat. Um, again, a wonderful artist, Alina Perez, and this beautiful Manasia. Uh, and I start, you know, it allows me just to think through experiences I've had as a woman, as a plus size woman, eating has always been quite a challenge or eating publicly. And so I think a lot about what would a woman do when no one's looking and when no one's looking, I am queen of my fridge. 
And I think everyone is. We don't care what we, you know, we don't not not eating with our mouth covered. We're just there when we're comfortable. And so thinking about you know, what would women do when no one's looking and no one is judging them, which is something I think we learn to to work around as women, the, the male gaze and this idea of how we're supposed to portray ourselves. Um, this is another one of my favorites just because I find it very funny. I don't stop thinking it's a portrait of a woman in an outlet, which I think is a very funny series of words. And I just love that she has a mask on and I love playing with the romantic colors and the flowers and, and making it almost dry and real of just casually waiting for her face mask to be done. Um, yes, well, that's something I wanted to say before. I'm happy I remembered. I took note of it, but I did not read my notes. One thing that I felt very limited by with my sculptures and before this body of work for chart was that I only ever used myself as a reference and that really limited how I could portray a woman because I only know how I've been a woman. I don't really know how anyone else has and I certainly don't know what it means to be a black woman or a thin woman or any other variations other than a white straight plus size lady born in France. That's all I know. And so reaching out to these women allowed me to no longer have just a sea of white women, which was a lot of my sculptures and paintings were up until then, but actually recreate, you know, real, you know, real women who are not like me. And that's, I think, not, uh, I can't really give myself the right to imagine what it feels like to be anything but me. So I needed other women to work with. And that's what these sculptures allowed me to do. They were for my solo show as well. And they're all influenced by real women in my life. And again, they all look back to our history. This is a, one of my students back in 2016 or 17 or so told me about this mole she has on her butt that she just always tries to see, but she's just too far away from looking at it, from being able to see it. But I just imagine her in her bedroom doing this beautiful twist to see this mole on her butt and how beautiful that is, but also how understandably some may not think checking out your butt mole is the most beautiful thing in the world, but I don't know about you, but that's quite lovely to me. Um, these are paintings that happened after my solo show where I, you know, took a lot of the same ideas as before, just a woman in her space. I'm thinking much more about light and I don't know. It's all just more incredible women in my life that I'm so honored to be able to paint. Same with Kukuya. I only noticed after that I hope that tea is very cold and not a hot boiling tea because in my mind it's as warm as a winter day and she's drinking hot tea and then I forgot who pointed out that if that were indeed hot tea she'd be burnt. Um, but I just love I feel very excited painting women. I, I feel very excited trying to do my best to make them feel very good about themselves. I think most likely I'm speak to, speaking to a younger version of myself who may have needed to hear this, but you know, it's it's like a it's like a dirty pleasure. Sometimes I feel like it's it's truly selfish because I just love making women feel good about themselves. If that's my one mission in life, then I am happy it's it's that. Same here. This is me getting back into watercolors. Um, you can see, but so it's so different from what I was doing in 2014, not just from the introducing the body back into it, but the lighting and the honesty of this moment. In the picture, she's actually lying down holding a rose, the one that she sent me. And I love that I turned the rose into a remote. Um, you know, I think a lot of these pieces are just me trying to make myself laugh and hoping others do it too and finding the romance in these things. This is Tess Holliday, who is the creator of the F Your Beauty Standard tag and like business, I guess. I think it's a business. And she was, she is the first plus size woman I ever looked up to and I ever knew was successful and out there. And, you know, to 10 years after discovering her, get to paint her was felt like a big moment. 
and such an honor. And she just looks like a, just such a goddess. And she's covered in these incredible tattoos and her body is just so big and takes up so much space. And she's so proud of it and she owns it. And I think there's a lot to be learned from her. Uh, this is another iteration of that bath that I showed you earlier on of my mother lying in, uh, lying in a bath and getting to know her body. And, you know, this is my first friend who was pregnant. So I think, you know, I think it's very easy to see how my work always connects to how I'm experiencing myself and the women around me. And so I'm 30 now and I'm having, there are too many babies on my Instagram and Facebook and she's the first one. And to, to add this to the many ways of being a woman is very important. Here's a water color of me, my bath and the very beautiful Serenia. And again, just imagining and recreating more moments that feel honest to me as a woman. I was told on my many practice runs that I fill up space with unnecessary descriptions and I could just let you all look at these pictures, but no, I can't stop talking, it's a curse. I like to joke that I was very shy until I was like 13 or 14 and I never really spoke. And I started speaking a lot when I was 14 and I'm just catching up with 13 years of being silent. Like I had a quota of words I have to reach and I'm just catching up with those 13 years of shyness. And I'm probably close, but I still have many more words to say. So now we're at um, Wednesday night, which is a show that's up at Ava right now. The one that this artist talk is about. Um, here is my dear friend Caroline that you saw earlier on. I really enjoy the title Wednesday night because it is both incredibly specific and it means absolutely nothing. It's a completely random day and a random time. And I think that's when most things happen in our life at a random time when nothing special is really happening. And those are the moments that are truest to at least my experience up until now. And Seeing all of these women together and seeing them interact, which is not something I've not, it took a long time for all my sculptures to be able to be shown in one space, was, uh, I don't know, it, it, it led me to my new body of work, which is thinking about women with another woman. It's one plus one, not just one woman, but two women. I'm, I'm making it's that's what the show allowed me to do was to look at all these i think the last sorry for skipping i'm skipping through these too fast um seeing all these women in one space made me think of roommates living in a house together or other shared spaces that women have um, and what does it mean for a woman to allow another woman into her space i'm slowly getting there these are, again, all these little bits and pieces that make up my story as much as my body does and as much as representation of my body does. Here you go. Here's the angry waxer, Sophia. Um, yeah, so seeing this image and seeing all my ladies together, I think really led to my current body of work, which I said women plus and another woman. And what does it mean to have control over your space and to want someone in. I think growing up, as I said, in France, a lot of the representation of multiple women was about, um, were typically performers. You'd have dancers or women getting ready to, to be seen by others, but rarely was it about a woman in a moment just for herself and someone else. And I really wanted to, you know, make that my next body of work. So these are my more recent digital collages. As you can see, it's me, 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 and me, um, which is, as someone, as I said, who has body dysmorphia and isn't a living, looking at herself, seeing three versions of myself in one space is quite exciting. And here's another one. My lovely friend Vicky modeling with me. Here is me having a very converse, important conversation with me. Um, and finally, uh, my I am currently working on another installation that will be taking place in a couple months. 
and it's based on the three graces. And this is the digital collage. Ignore my silly faces that I'm making, but the digital collage that I use to um, figure out the installation. And it's, I'm thinking back a lot of the, me as a young woman in my early 20s. That's the last time I lived with women. And what did we do when we were together? And how did I, how important those moments were with these women now that I live alone with a man? Um, I mildly miss the days of being 22 and living with multiple women and how freeing and exhilarating that was and how much I had to learn. I didn't grow up with sisters. I just have a brother. So having intimacy with women was quite a thrill and not something I had a lot of practice with. And so I think a lot of these paintings and this installation is me you know, thinking about what it means, which is, as you can tell, a lot of my work I'm told I should not use the word therapy too much, but I, I, I do have a bachelor's in psychology, so I am very interested in this. And I, I spend, I'm a mildly a workaholic, so I spend a lot of my time alone in my studio. So I get a lot of time with me, myself, and I. And so, you know, I have to figure these things out one way or the other. And it turns out my way of doing it is visually. And so that's how... I got to where I am now. I feel like I stumbled a little bit in the middle there, but it was a nice linear story. Mm, I think, oh, I forgot I have one more slide. My last slide, which is, uh, it's a painting of two women, Elise and Leah. And this is one of the paintings that is in my show at Chart that's opening in March 6th. And it's one of the first women paintings I did of multiple women. And it was, I don't know, I very much love this painting. I love the intimacy these two women have. You know, I, I think a lot of portrayal, as I said, of women are prepping to perform, you know, and it's never about what it means for them to be together. And I just, you know, these two women are dating, they're dating brothers. So they're like sisters and, I don't know the right word, sisters in law. That seems like the right word. And I just, I love that that doesn't matter. I mean, that you know, that's just a fact, but the reality is just these two women who are clearly very close to one another and very comfortable and you know, it makes me excited and hopeful. And that's my, that's my work up till now. Thank you, Shona. Um, it's amazing. It's, it's amazing to see like your story kind of, like you said, it's very linear. Um, we do have a couple of comments and questions in the chat. Um, so Jim Sokol, want, he's interested in the process, especially the material used to construct the flesh, so like of your sculptures. Those, so they're all paper mache. Uh, my first sculpture I ever made was right before I started grad school, and I went home to Paris to see my family. And I needed to make something that was uh, easily transportable. And I had just seen a YouTube video of this woman who loved her French bulldog. And she made a paper mache version of this bulldog. And at that point, I'd only done watercolors. But a paper mache version of it, that seemed just right up my alley. And so it started with something very innocent. That's just a medium that I can do. And it turned into this body of work now. But I love paper mache because as a... As I said, I'm really good at perseverance and paper mache to make it look like it does in these sculptures. I need to overwork them. I mean, I sand, I like to say there's a reason why I'm so strong is because of how much I sand and how much, you know, there's a lot of physical work that goes into it. And I'm, I enjoy that about paper mache. I enjoy that it's a, a more craft like medium, which, you know, craft is very much associated to, with, with women and, I just like the history of it. And, and I have to say, I, I've never had someone know my sculpture's paper mache. I think out of a, a thousand people, only a couple will guess. People think it's plaster. They think it's a cast. You know, it's not always clear that it's paper mache. I like that it allows me to do so. And that is something like when you hear that the, the medium is paper mache, you kind of go back to like, you know, elementary school, like crafting. And so you think that's really flimsy, but I can tell you all from moving the ladies around the gallery, they are very sturdy and, and heavy. <laughs> um, it's not, 
you know, they are very much sculpted. It's really, it's really cool. Um, the, go ahead. I have to say the, my sculpture of the woman's uh, waxing, I have more than once cut my foot like, stuck in her hand and they just don't break. I mean, instead I'm the one who trips as I drag it across the room. They're unbreakable. And that's another reason why I like it so much is because I'm, I'm certainly not a, I'm not, I'm very clumsy. I have to accept that about myself. It's part of who I am. So I really needed work that would respond to me that way and not break at, you know, every time I stepped on them. Yeah, a forgiving material. Mm -hmm. um, so Natasha wanted to know, I'm guessing about your work, like, is it therapeutic or cathartic? Both. I think it allows me to look back at what I've experienced, but also look forward of how I wish to develop. I think, it, you know, from painting women who inspire me to painting parts of myself that I hated throughout my time as a, you know, on this, as a human. So both, I think it, it really does, it helps me look in both, in all directions. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a bunch of comments just saying like, your work uh, truly resonates with me. I'm so glad you're doing these pieces. I love it. Splendid presentation, beautiful and important work, um, and so on and so forth. Um, Sarah, do you you said and sometime to continue on some some work? Will you uh, elaborate on what your question is? Oh, you're muted. Um, I think you said with some of the p one piece in particular that you kept working. So am I correct? Sometimes you will keep working and changing some pieces. Um, I, w I like to say rarely. I do think it is very nice to have something mark a time. Mm -hmm, period mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Changed. But a sculpture like Charlotte, the one that mm -hmm. The most she actually tried I've done a couple road trips with her and I photographed her across I drove from Philadelphia to California uh -huh. and I did 15 stops and posed her in front of motels or <laughs> all right. really wonderful places mm -hmm. and the reactions people have when I carry out a life-size sculpture actually a funny story a cop I, someone called a cop on me because <laughs> I, thought I was carrying a woman's body into a motel and I was not, it was a sculpture, but I did get a great picture of him taking a picture of my sculpture. So I guess that's great. Um, she did a lot of work because I, I worked her. But no, I hope, I tend to like to leave things where they are. Uh -huh. Okay. It was actually something I think a lot about. Thank uh, you. So Timothy said, hi Shona, you often draw from personal narrative and private moments. Can you talk a little bit about negotiating vulnerability in a public manner? Yeah, well, I think a very easy example of that is my spring break installation of me and my boyfriend lying in bed in a big re I literally I stood for a whole week watching thousands of people because it was at an art fair and there were so many people. And I just watched people look at me lying in bed naked. I mean, it, it looked a lot like my body at that time. And if I happened to be renting an Airbnb that had the exact sheets that I had painted for that installation. So it felt so true to my life. And it was a thrill. I mean, it felt like a high, if anything, to confront something that scared me so much, which is this intimate moment of me lying naked with my boyfriend and, you know, being naked in front of people is not something I've done a lot of and being very comfortable with. So my boyfriend was a first. And then the next step was, I guess, telling everyone else it was a first by sculpting it and presenting it to them. Um, so facing these vulnerable moments and sharing them. And I, again, I think I really grew up thinking I was the only woman who had leg hair, anything, anything that happened to my body, I assumed I was the only person who was struggling the way I did. And I think so much of what I do is, it's almost like saying, and what about you? You know, I sculpt it and I paint it and I hope someone comes to me and says, that's just like me. And then I just sigh. I'm like, okay, well then, you know, maybe I'm not that weird or maybe we're all weird rather. Um, and so I, you know, face the vulnerability. And that's what really drew me to your work is the vulnerability, you know, uh, that's in it. I mean, I can, 
like you're saying with all of the the real moments, real women, you know, all these moments as a woman, I can look at it and recognize, oh, I've done that. You know, this feels real. This feels like me. Um, so it is really great. Like, I think that's why so many people gravitate towards it because it is a real moment. It is personal, but I can also recognize myself in those moments, um, which is really powerful. Um, I think I have a question. Go for yeah. it, John. Um, and, and it's just from... It, it, at one point in your lecture, you taught, you referenced the, the telephone game mm -hmm. and Lucas Blaylock, who's the other exhibiting artist at Ava right now, his exhibition is actually called Lucas Blaylock in telephone. And he is referencing that same game. And so I, after you said that, I was trying to figure out, like I was trying to draw parallels because on the surface, your work could not be more different, but I felt like maybe one thing that both your work does is at least it's sort of like exploring this idea of like how we as a culture look at images and how that's maybe changed and just our current like culture of images. Um, and, and it made me think about how like you probably more than any other artist who've exhibited at Ava, you have a really, really strong social media presence. And I'm curious, like if you, if you have anything that you could say about like how just your interaction with social media and that sort of like influx of images, like does that really affect your practice in the same way as like the way you look at art history? Like what is that relationship like? And is that something that you think about a lot? I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I don't, I don't know exactly what I'm asking, but that's sort of, I'm curious if you, if you, what you well, could say about that. What I, when you say social media, I think of, Tess Holiday was a model I painted a couple, she was lying on a couch and that's where I discovered her was social media and she was posting herself at home and post and revealing herself in many ways. So I do think my work is responding a lot to that. I feel like I'm, I almost forgot what your question is. So I'm at this point, I'm just gonna respond to what is social media? <laughs> um, uh, but that's, I think that's how my work works in and I would, in that world is responding to all these women who have used Instagram and Facebook and whatever, TikTok, whatever's newest, to be honest. I think the same way right now I'm giving a public talk, but I'm also sitting in my kitchen and you've heard my dog run after my cat and my, my boyfriend run after my dog running after my cat. Um, and, you know, this is just as real as anything else I do and I get to... And I think Instagram does the same thing. It's it's both absolutely not real, but it is real as in I'm, it's how they're choosing to present themselves and share themselves. And I was a lot of the women I paint, well, no, I take it back. Every single woman I paint, I found them either through Instagram or I've reached out to them through Instagram or they were friends on there. And that's how I know. So social media is a huge part of my practice and how I think women have gained, regained control over how, what, what is an image of a woman? And we've had so little control for so long as women and social media and my Instagram page is completely under my control. Though, of course, then comes in the subject of censorship and that actually Instagram has a lot, a big play on what can be seen and not seen. But at least I get you know, to try to post anything I want to post. Yeah. So that's what social media. No, that's, that's exactly the type of thing I was asking, well, hoping you would talk about. So thank you. I did it. So we have one more question, and then I think we're out of time, everybody. So Natasha asked, um, you don't seem to be outwardly insecure about your weight um, issues, um, you know, in parentheses, neither in your life or in your art. Are you using yourself now more than ever? Plus size women often want to become skinnier um, while others are simply good as they are in Ashley Graham thoughts. Loving, loving yourself, loving yourself. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I mean, yes, yes. I mean, I've changed so much. I still have many days where I'd, I'd rather not see myself in the mirror and I feel saddened. That I'm not a thin woman, which is what I thought I'd one day become. I'd grow up into to be a thin woman. Turns out you have to work for it. Or some women have to, you know, everyone has a different body, but it didn't happen naturally for me. Um, 
But I think when I was younger, and I think a lot about this, when you're young, you don't have many things that define you because you have not experienced a lot, you've not done a lot. And so my weight and my body was one of the few things that did define me. And I think the older I get, the more definitions I have for myself. And being thin isn't one of them. And I'm okay with it now because I have so many more things that are very interesting about me. And uh, if being thin is not one of them, that's okay. Because I think I make interesting work and I think I can tell a good joke. And, you know, I'm all these things have become more important to me. And my body in a way has become less so I'm able to discuss it and I'm able to share it with people and think about it in a way that wasn't how I used to when it felt critical it felt like the only thing that mattered was that I was pretty in in a beauty standards kind of way and now I'm not scared about that as much anymore so that's where my weight comes to play in my everyday life as well as in my work where I think what I love about my sculptures is that you get to get up close and look at them and they have moles and they have things that are delicate and just theirs. And then you may forget for a split second that she has a big belly because who cares about a big belly? And, you know, so I do think I play with their, you know, what it means to be looking at a woman's body or to, you know, yes. Um, so we have some really nice comments I'm going to read to you really quick. So Christina Nicodema said, Shona, your work is incredible. And you discussed something that I really relate to, the idea of missing intimacy with other women, like when we were in our early 20s. It's a period of time that we don't fully grasp how special it is at that time. And when I experience your work and listen to you discuss it, I feel like I get to experience that intimacy through your work. It's so poignant. and it really resonates with me. As a woman, I can recognize myself in so much of your work and it leaves me feeling included and connected. Um, and then Natasha said, um, ironically, there are so often articles from France and how French women are skitty, skinny as it uh, may relate to diet and walking, dot, dot, dot. Self-acceptance and self-awareness are lifelong goals. Keep it up. Your work is great, and you are lovely. Well, I do have to say, growing up in fr I, my high school, my high school classmates were actual international models because I went to high school in France. So, if you want to know what it means to question what it, to to really ponder what it means to be a plus-size woman, you should sit in a room full of seventeen-year-old models. Um, so yes, France definitely has a lot of thin women and that's probably where my weight and my body, why it became critical to how I see everything. Well, I want to thank you, Shona. I know we could probably sit here for hours and talk. I know I could, cause I love talking to you. It's always a pleasure. I want to thank you for your time tonight and everybody who um, put comments in the chat, I'll make sure that Shona sees your comments. I'll copy it in an email to her so she'll see all the kind words and all the thoughtful responses <laughs> to your work um and so yeah thank you so much um for your time this has thank been wonderful everyone. i feel much less nervous so. <laughs> you did you wonderful did you did great okay, thank you thank so you much. i also just i also really quick want to tell you shona that your watercolors i have not seen too many of them and they're fantastic thank you we made a, a yeah. good amount for my solo show at Chart, so you'll get to. They're my original. They're my bay. Yeah, they, no, it's but even the even the first ones from 2014 are incredible. Incredible. Uh, anyway, mm -hmm. just congratulations. The show looks great. We were we're happy to have it. Well, thank you. I'm very happy. Good night, everyone. <laughs>